in 2009, uh, Time Magazine called School of One uh, one, of the, one of the most important inventions of the year. And it's because it's really a, an engineered uh, math program that takes m multiple forms of content um, and uses a, a computer algorithm to make recommendations uh, to teachers. So it's a, a, a great example of the, the kind of um, advanced tools uh, in, in a coherent program that we should see more of in the next few years. Joel Rose of New Classrooms. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you all uh, for taking the time to learn a little bit about what we do. Uh, just a little housekeeping to kick this off. Uh, Tom mentioned I started something called School of One at the New York City Department of Education. Uh, then left to start a new nonprofit called New Classrooms. We have a new model called Teach to One. We're currently operating Teach to One in Chicago and in Washington, D.C. And Teach to One is now powering School of One in New York City. Uh, there are a lot of similarities in, and approach, and there's, the approach is similar, but there are a number of differences. When we talk about Teach to One, School of One, what we're doing, it really begins uh, talking about this guy, Horace Mann. So Horace Mann grows up in Massachusetts at a time where there is this tremendous tension between Catholics and Protestants. And he makes it his life's mission to create a more tolerant, civilized society. Uh, and so he goes with his wife for inspiration. They get on a boat, and they go to Prussia, where, in fact, they see this. One teacher and about 30 kids in a room. And they go, aha, that's what we need. I see the future, because that approach will teach kids from different backgrounds to learn to coexist. It solved the problem that he was trying to solve. This was back in 1843. Now, since then, we've gone from the stagecoach to the jet airplane. We've gone from the telegraph to the smartphone. We've gone from antiquated medicine to high-tech medical equipment. But we have not changed this fundamental view of how instruction is delivered. We still have one teacher and about 30 kids in a room. And if there's one thing that we know today, that any teacher can tell us today, that he probably didn't know back in 1843, it is how hard it is to differentiate instruction. It is this beautiful buzzword that people love, throwing, oh, just differentiate instruction, no problem. But the reality is, it is really, really hard. I'm a former fifth grade math teacher. And in my class, I remember, I had one student who was shy, who hated to work in groups, who loved technology. One wanted lots of attention but hated to handwrite. One was out of the country for three years, not in any school. One read books that were three years ahead but didn't want to look like a nerd. One played hours of video games every night. One was a talented artist who, who needed to see things visually. One two years ahead in math but a year behind in reading. And one loved to apply math concepts to sports. Any teacher will tell you they have these kids in their classroom and more. How do we possibly expect any teacher to personalize learning? This, by the way, is just 10 kids out of 25, and it's one class period out of five. And so our approach with Teach to One is to go that if we're serious, if we're really serious about meeting the needs of each and every student, the only way to do that is to view live, teacher-led instruction, the kind of instruction we just think about when we think about what school is, as one way. And it may be the best way, but it's not the only way we know kids can learn. We know they can learn collaboratively from each other in different sized groups. We know they can learn with virtual tutors located anywhere around the world. And we know they can learn by themselves, either with software or with printed material. And so we call all these different ways of delivering instruction modalities. And by integrating all of these modalities into one single learning environment, we move from a model that looks like this, which is what we're all familiar with, to one that looks more like this. And the reason this is so important is because in a multimodal classroom environment, we can now contemporaneously teach multiple things. So that teacher can only teach one thing. She's only human, as can that teacher up there. But every table can be learning something different. Every student with a virtual tutor can learn something different. Every student working by themselves up in that corner can learn something different. And so what Teach to One is, is the integration of multiple modalities of instruction into one learning environment in order to enable personalization. It is not bumper sticker material, but that's all it is that we're doing. Let me tell you how we get that done. The first thing we do is we start with a skill map. 
This is all based on the common core standards for real. It really is based on the common core standards. And we have math. Every skill has subskills. Those skills have subskills, and so on and so forth. Now, we work with kids in grades 6 to 8, but our skill map actually starts at the, at the fourth grade and goes all the way up to the 10th grade. We don't just assume because you're in sixth grade, you know everything from fourth grade and fifth grade. Horace Mann did. We don't. We administer a diagnostic assessment to see what are the skills each student knows and what are the skills they don't know. And we call the skills they don't know their playlist. And no two students have the same one. You might be on a seventh grade level in algebra and an eighth grade level in geometry. We actually don't even care what grade you're in. What we care about is what you know and what you don't know so we can figure out what it is you should learn next. So with that information, we have a, a profile of each student. We know what skills they're working on. And through surveying the student, the parent, in some cases the previous year's teacher, we can generate a hypothesis for what types of modalities might be most effective for each student. In this case, it looks like virtual live instruction might be an effective modality. And we learn a little bit about their interests. Now, this is the kind of information that lives in the heads of teachers. They build up over the course of a full school year. Then at the end of the year, it kind of just goes poof. And the next teacher has to build all that information up again. Well, we keep that information. So now we know a lot about Joseph. We know he needs to learn how to explain patterns. Virtual live instruction might be an effective modality. If you have sports, all the better. What we need now is content, a lesson that teaches explaining patterns, leverages live virtual instruction, somehow integrates sports. And so our team actually looked at over 40,000 middle school math lessons from large publishers, small ones, folks you heard of, folks you haven't, and chose what we thought were the very best 10,000 of them. Some of those lessons are live lessons delivered by teachers. Some of them are virtual. Some of them are collaborative. And some of them are independent. And we put data about each of those lessons in our system. This is a lesson from uh, McGraw-Hill. Teaches kids how to add fractions. Takes 29 minutes. Great for kids who like music, or whatever the case may be. Okay? And so now, we have all this data about each kid. And we have all this data about all these lessons. The question is, what do you do? with all of that data. Well, here's what we don't do. What we don't do is say to the teacher, here's all the data. Good luck trying to figure out what to do tomorrow. And so instead, that's what we created what we call the learning algorithm. And the best way to explain it is to think about what happens uh, when you go to the airport. There are weather problems in different cities. Certain planes only fit at certain gates. The technology organizes all of this for us. We just look up at the monitor, and we see the status of our flight, and we see our gate. It's the same concept here. Our algorithm takes all the data about each student, all the data about all the lessons, and with that creates a unique schedule for each teacher and each student each day based on the lessons that are going to be most successful for each one. And then at the end of every day, students take an online assessment. And with the data that we get every day, we can do four things. Number one, we determine whether the student is ready to move on to the next skill on her playlist. If she does well, she moves on. If not, she gets the same skill, but in a different way the next day. Two, we update the profile. So just like Amazon.com learns more about who you are as a consumer every time you shop online, we learn more about each learner. And we can use that information as we create subsequent schedules for that one student. Third, we go back to the content providers. And we say, Houghton Mifflin, your decimals lessons are doing great. Your fractions lessons, not so much or the great with girls or not with boys or different kinds of subgroups. Some of the publishers have been in business for 100 years. They have no idea that chapter 12 is great and chapter 17 is terrible. We're becoming more like an iTunes. Instead of buying albums, we buy songs. Instead of buying textbooks, we buy lessons. We pay them on the basis of how often we use them. And we schedule them in part on the basis of how good they actually are. And then finally, over time, as more students are in, enrolled in the system, the system itself gets smarter. It says, OK, Maria, who likes dance and is learning about area of a triangle, I've had 50,000 students like this before. And there's a great lesson from IXL and another one from Mathalicious. And it, so it can use that information to predict um, what might work for students who exhibit similar patterns. So that's the concept. Um, what I'd love to do now is show you uh, about a three and a half minute video that will show you what this looks like when it all uh, comes into action.
What we see in lots of urban schools is a wide variety of student levels. We've got schools with kids coming into middle school on a third grade level. They form different countries, they have different cultures, they speak different languages. They can be kinesthetic, they can be verbal, they can be visual learners. How do you actually teach to this diverse group of students? School of One is based on one simple idea, that we are organizing an entire school around the needs of every one student. I like the online tutors because you get to like work with different teachers from all around the world. The other day I was working with a teacher from North Carolina. Edwin, how many threes did we just have? Five. Right. I like how we get to use computers to learn math because I never did that before. There are eight different ways that students can learn and five of them are live and three of them are on computers. I like to work with other people, but not too many people. You're working with a small group of kids, one teacher and like eight, about eight kids. I like the communication with the tutor online. I get scared sometimes if I have to look at a teacher and ask them the question, but sometimes you just type the question and they answer it. At the end of the day, what happens is the students take a five question assessment. If they pass their test, they move on to another skill. When it says green, that's like a when you have a yellow, you kind of have like a down phase because you're like kind of sad and you want to achieve more because you know you could do better. When you get red on your modality, you're like, ah! If they have not passed the test, then the algorithm figures out a new way to teach the student that specific skill. As the algorithm gets smarter, as it learns the student's skills, it learns their levels, the student gets smarter. The teachers get smarter. We all grow at the same time. One of the main ideas of School of One is to have technology take a lot off teachers' plate so they can focus on doing what they came into this profession to do. The algorithm allows us to teach. It allows us to do what we are trained to do. It allows us to do what the Department of Education has invested in us. School of One is making me the amazing teacher that I always wanted to be. I'm grateful for that. One of the teachers overheard a student say to another student, I am smart, I am not stupid. It had made her wonder, how long has this one student been harboring the belief that she was stupid? And the only thing that was really stupid was the way we were teaching her. Any one of these children can grow up to be anything they want to be. President of the United States, a teacher like me. But because of circumstances of birth, they don't have the opportunity. And the school of one gives them that opportunity. It levels the playing field. I love my teacher. I love the algorithm. I love when a parent comes in and says, what are you doing here? Because my daughter is doing all sorts of wild math. I'm a lot better student now. It really helps me learn faster. I love when I see a kid excited about this one connection that was just made. I love school of one. Every student in New York City is waiting for School of One. So hopefully you saw in that video how we tried to reimagine the entire delivery model from changing the physical space to using technology to help organize learning. But kids don't just spend their time online. They work collaboratively. They work with teachers. We use technology as one way of delivering instruction and as the way to schedule, to organize the logistics around implementation of this multimodal type of an environment. Now, we've been at this for about three years now, our team has, uh, and we're still figuring this out. I think our model today is probably 60% baked. Every day we learn something about how the technology can get better, how our professional development can, can get better, how we can improve the academics. Uh, we've seen some exciting results. So after the very first year of implementation of School of One, there were three schools implementing the program. Uh, one that had the most experience saw positive and statistically significant gains. Uh, a second school was even and a third school went down versus peer schools. Um, the school that went down, the state said, they did a report and they came into the school and they said, look, we found 100 things wrong with the school, we need to shut it down. There are three things right with it, one of which is school of one, but we cannot, it's, it's not fairy dust, so we need a certain level of capacity in order to be successful. School A, which had a great implementation, said, look, Joel's leaving New York City, the whole thing is in transition, we're going to take a little bit of a break. But School B said, we want to give this one more year. And so last year was the second year of implementation uh, of School of One, and here are the results that we saw there. Uh, we gave every student the Terra Nova in both the fall and the spring and can look at the gain rates and compare those to national means. We saw a 22-point gain 
um, on the Terra Nova at the sixth grade level versus 11 points as a national mean. At the seventh grade level, we saw a 12 point gain versus six points as the national mean. And then in eighth grade, which is really where we focus a lot of our energy, we want kids to spend their first year we fill gaps to make sure they have the right foundation so they can be successful in eighth grade and be high school ready. And that's where we saw our greatest gains, 23 points um, versus six points as a national mean. Now, what, from a policy perspective, what was especially interesting and exciting about these results, and again, this is just one school, one year, no one's saying we've cracked the code here. But what was especially interesting to us was if you follow New York City education politics a little bit, you might know that New York City released the value added data of every teacher in the city um, about six months ago. And so you can go online and look up any school and see what percent of teachers, based on that metric at least, are rated above average or high. So for example, uh, the KIPP schools, 80% of math are rated above average or high, uncommon schools, 100%. This was based on the 2009-2010 school year, which was the year before we started working in the school. So the question is, how much of the results that we've seen can be attributed to stacking the deck with great teachers versus how much is really the model itself. And what we saw was interesting, only 10%, meaning 10% of the teachers rated above average or high, and we were still getting some of those outside gains. Now, obviously in any school, the better the teachers, the better the results. But what we think we're learning is that with new types of models, new next generation models, smart use of technology, we can see some extraordinary gains being made at all levels of the teaching profession. So with that, um, I will open it up to questions. Pretty cool, huh? Could we, at, at some day, do you, do you see um, a, a bigger portion of, of a school day operating this way, with an algorithm guiding teachers and, and using dynamic scheduling? Sure. Uh, I think what's important is not necessarily the algorithm or the scheduling, that's part of it, but what's important is that we actually dedicate some real time and money and energy towards designing new ways of learning. Think about the hundreds of million dollars we spend on designing new airplanes or, or spacecrafts or, or, or cars. Uh, we don't really spend much time or money designing a different classroom experience that then can be shared with, with the rest of the country. So we need folks designing new ways of delivering science instruction and literacy instruction. And yes, I can see a world one day where states, districts, or even principals, instead of adopting a math textbook, they adopt one of these different types of approaches, one of these models. And then those model providers actually help share in the accountability for outcomes. It could be that some folks do more than one subject. Could be we just do one subject. Okay. Yes? Uh, did you, did you uh, explore at all violating the age, the age structure of learning uh, with this So we do use age cohorts, meaning all the sixth graders have math, then all the seventh graders have math, and then all the eighth graders have math. Um, the reason for that is a couple of reasons. One, it's just logistically easier. But two is, um, you know, when you have kids working collaboratively, and if you have sixth graders working with eighth graders, it gets kind of a little funny. Eighth graders don't want to be viewed as working at the sixth grade level. So um, we just thought it was easier to sort of keep it with age-based groupings for, for social reasons. I think the main reason to do it is for the social and, and personality reasons. I mean, there's no reason from a content perspective. You know, we've got kids, as I said in the video, you know, in middle school working on a third grade level. They could, in theory, learn with third grade kids. I just don't know if that could create other problems. But you, you've really engineered a competency-based environment <laughs> where kids are moving at their own pace, right? Correct, correct. And, you, and it's all mixed up each day. So you might be you know, with, with a group of fourth graders one day, a group of seventh graders the next day, because you're not labeled as a fast learner or a slow learner, it's really where you are in that particular skill. You, you, um, you developed something called uh, sort of the par value. Like how, how many yeah. experiences does it take on average for a kid to learn a particular concept? That seems like it's really useful. Right, so what we do for every skill in our skill map is we have a concept we call par, which is how many lessons do we think it should take the average student to master a particular skill? So if you're Learning how to add fractions with unlike denominators, that might be a par four. But once you've learned that, subtracting fractions with unlike denominators might be a par two. And so every day we see where each student is against par. 
And if they're at par or below, it's green. You heard the student talking about, I'm not green, I'm OK. If it's above par, it becomes red. So the, the teachers really manage by exception. They look at every day. If you didn't pass your test that day, but you've only had two exposures and it's a par four, it's still green. No one's worried about it. If you get to five, six, then it will turn red. So par is really what sort of helps us manage the outliers. Right. You had a question? So how did, how did teachers work together in your model? Hugely important. Uh, we build in a common planning time every day. In fact, because we're serving all the sixth graders, all the seventh graders, and all the eighth graders at once, it actually frees up time for them to meet as a team. They all have iPads, and they're looking for the kids who are red. Who are the kids who are either taking too long to learn a particular skill? Why is Johnny struggling with um, circumference of a circle? Oh, he's multiplying or he's, he's dividing, whatever the case may be. So they use that data to drive common planning time each day. Yep. Yeah. Can the parents uh, access the data of, of their individual child at home? The, can parents see data? Not only can they, um, in fact, it's one of the things that teacher, kids complain about the most because it says, my parent have to see every test every, all the time. Um, but now what we've, uh, we're putting in as a new feature where not only can the parents see it at home, the student can actually go online, see what's coming up next. So if our algorithm says, look, we don't think, Johnny, you know, how to do area of a triangle. Because our diagnostic says you don't know how to do it. And he goes, no, I know how to do it because my elder sister sat down with me and I practiced and I know how to do it. He signs up for a prove it slip. He comes in the next day. He gets an online assessment. If he gets a perfect score, he gets the credit for passing that skill without using any class time. So we've tried to be much smarter about how we use out of class time, both from the parent's perspective, but also to giving the kid an opportunity to accelerate her learning. So in the last, uh session, you asked the question about um, sort of an individual learning plan. So here you have an example of a really intelligent front end that's sitting on different bodies of content that can take into account the, the way students learn. So it, it, does this look a little bit closer to what you had in mind? So I, I think one of the most important concepts of this decade that you introduced is this idea of a customized playlist. That, like for a lot of people like me, was sort of a conceptual breakthrough. Um, a lot of us think that's a pretty big deal. Well, look, um, once you sort of break the Horace Mann, one teacher, and 28 kids in a room, and you say, wait, let's just not assume that. I mean, a lot of schools today, they say, let's talk about innovation. OK, let's put one teacher, 28 kids, in an 800 square foot room, and then we'll have the conversation about innovation. It's game over. <laughs> Think differently about all the inputs and how would you do it if you could really design things from scratch. Um, and in doing that, you realize that, that everything else is so much more customized in the, in the world. Why can't learning be just, just as customized? Yep. Is there um, any um, application that uh, is in your program that shows kind of an integration between the subjects, such as math and science, putting those two together, or putting out here a lot of skill teaching? Where, where are you, is there any application? Yeah. So the question's about yeah. um, application within Teach to One? Uh, so let me answer, there's two questions, I'm going to unpack both of those. So we're currently focused on math. Ultimately we can see ways to have this be implemented in other content areas. Uh, but for now the main thing it's doing is it's, it's being, I think, positively provocative in the other content areas. So there was a social studies teacher who said to me, you know, I was in class one day, I taught a lesson, I said, okay, now we're going to move on. And the kid raised his hand and said, wait, wait, why are you moving on? I don't get it yet. <laughs> And in all her years of teaching, no, te no kid had ever said that to her before, but that, she didn't have a good answer for it. So oh. that is useful. Um, in terms of application within the model, that's why I had this chart, just in case I was asked this very question. Uh, so uh, one of the things we've done in Teach to One is we've really changed the whole structure of the program. Over a two-week period, we call it a round. Uh, each day, there's a 90-minute block of time. And students experience two sessions. The first kind of session, which is the blue circle, is called a pickup session. These are the discrete skills we want kids to know. Area of a triangle, circumference of a circle, factoring binomials, those kinds of things. But then we've also sort of laced across the, um, the round a, a, a task, a project, a problem-based learning, where at the end of that period they have a task demonstration where they have to apply their learning. So for example, one of our tasks is at the end of a two-week period, students have to demonstrate whether or not they choose to buy a hybrid car. 
And the lessons, the, the, tri the uh, rectangular lessons involve rate equals distance times time and tax rebates and all the sorts of things that sort of build up to that so they can demonstrate their and apply their learning at the end of that period. Um, they also have a playlist quiz at the end where they apply all the things they learn in both task and in pickup over the two-week period. So answer is absolutely. No, they know that you know the, the, the five question assessments that we do each day count for one thing, and then their demonstrations count for something else, and they know that they are involved in, in, in applying these things. And Joel, I, um, I've been in uh, some online discussions in the last week with um, people that are in favor of passion-driven or interest-driven mm -hmm. learning, and they're worried that competency-based <laughs> models like this feel like testing all the time. You know, you, you end every, every day with a quiz. Do you, how, how do you think about that from the student experience standpoint? Do you, do you think they experience that as testing all the time? We had a, a student, uh, it was a, a tour going on, and one of, the, one of the members of the tour, one of the students said, what do you think about taking a test every day? And the student said, we don't take tests, we take assessments. Mm -hmm. They don't think of it like tasks. Mm -hmm they know that, that these things called assessments actually help to guide their own instruction. It's for their own benefit. And so you know, they view it as just a natural part um, of the learning process. Um, the playlist quiz are a little bit more high stakes for them uh, as a way they conceive yeah. it, but not the daily assessments. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes? So then are the actual quizzes or tests what determine their grades? Yeah, so the, the teachers determine their grades. Um, what we do is we share with each of the teachers what the best practices are. Right now we're in eight different schools of what different schools do it. So they may say 40% of your grade is how many skills you've mastered, 20% is your task demonstration, 10% is homework, some of it's classwork. So we give them all the data. Um, they all have iPads. They can put the classwork, participation levels, work ethic, homework, all the things go into the iPad. And then we give them the data dump and they decide how they want to weight the different and numbers to, to So the grade. interesting thing, both of your questions are interesting because you're asking questions about a, a customized competency-based math program that sits within a, a cohort school model, right? Right. Um, so one of the design challenges is, you know, how do you do this school-wide? How do you do what, what Mike Kerr has, has done in his K-2 uh, school-wide? So th that's why I think... Of right. And so that's, that's why, you know, there's a lot that I appreciate about Joel, the, the idea of par value, the idea of customized playlists, but also his emphasis on sort of engineered uh, learning experiences, learning pathways, really investing in um, better ways to learn, better ways for teachers to work together with kids. So we, we appreciate the work sure. that, uh, that you're doing. Join me in giving him a round of applause. Thank you.